Thanks. Thanks for coming. Um, my name is Kevin O'Donnell. I'm the head of sales over at Buildox. Um, I spent seven years as a mechanical engineer. Um, <laughs> I actually built out manufacturing equipment before moving into sales. I, I programmed um, and designed assembly line robotics. You often found me late at night dancing with, with robots in a clean room environment um, all by myself. So uh, those were those were my sadder years, I suppose. <laughs> um, since then, I moved into sales. Uh, you know, I I felt like I, I really enjoyed the aspect of sales. That was, um, you know, working with people and solving problems. And I worked at Procore for a long time, helped thousands of general contractors and specialty contractors up level the way they were doing things in the industry. Um, and I recently moved over to build ops. Um, I, I, I love improving construction best practices and, and just positively impacting the industry with tech. Um, build Ops represents a really awesome opportunity and um, just what we're doing and, and changing the industry. And um, so couldn't be more excited to be a part of it. Um, but really, really excited today to sit down here with uh, Joe Kermzer. Um, he is the CEO of Premise Star. Previously known as Reedy Industries, we'll get into that uh, rebranding a little bit later. I believe that just went on, um, but um, you probably all know of Reedy as just an industry leader in HVAC, mechanical services, and, and building automa automation solutions um, for the commercial and industrial facilities. Um, they employ over 1,200 people, um, including 900 field techs. So. Um, you know, Joe comes with a wealth of knowledge from the industry. We're really excited to learn more. Um, you know, part of his story is, you know, since joining in 2019, Joe's created and overseen the implementation of some new business strategy. Um, we've seen uh, a 250% increase in revenues uh, under Joe, which is pretty cool. Um, he's got to share 300% increase in EBITDA. And, um, and a number of really exciting acquisitions. So um, welcome, Joe. Really excited to have you. Thank you, Kevin. It's good to be here. Yeah. Thank you. Appreciate it. Yeah. So um, look, man, uh, you know, we want to pick your brain. You know, we started out talking uh, about how you're, you're an expert in all things. We, uh, we decided we ought, to, we ought to limit that a little bit. You know, we're not yes, going to get too far <laughs> off the... Uh, out of our lane here, but um, yeah. truly an expert in, in, in many, many things involving um, this industry, right? What we're all here to listen to and what we're all here to learn about. So um, I don't know, why don't you tell us a little bit just about yourself and, and, and your role at, uh, at Premise Star? Yeah, yeah, no, thanks, Kevin. It's great to be here. Um, it's been an interesting ride. I, I started my career actually in, in a variety of different sales and marketing and ops type roles and eventually led me down a path of large public companies, large conglomerates like General Electric and United Technologies. I was much more on the non-sexy areas like plastics and electrical distribution and uh, tractor trailer financing, which when you're, when you're 10 years old, you, you're not exactly thinking that's what I was going to be the shortstop of the New York Yankees that fell through. Uh, so I went a different route, but I ended up going down that path and, and, and eventually ended up at United Technologies as the president of Linnell Systems, which is the really still today the world's largest and most established leader in access control systems for large campus environments, Fortune 500 companies, municipals, et cetera. And that, that job really opened my world to two things in particular, software being one, very applicable here to build ops because Linnell is primarily a software company, but two, integrated building systems. One of the reasons Linnell system was so successful and still is today is that it integrates with a variety of different you know, software systems that are used to run a building, run a business, everything from HR management software to vending machines to, to fire and, and overall security solutions. So um, that, that job really opened my eyes. I was there for four years. We did some very, very interesting things, grew the business. And I realized at the age of 38 with my, uh, my fourth daughter on the way, um, still ha happy to have my hair, uh, <laughs> that it was time to make a move. And um, I wanted to see what private equity had to offer. I had heard a lot about it and had a lot of concerns, like I'm sure a lot of people on the phone now are thinking about or potentially will if they listen to the recording or watch the recording. But I wanted to take a risk. And my, my feeling was under the weight and size and in often cases, the bureaucracy of a large public company, um, it, it's hard to treat the key stakeholders the way you want to, your customers, your employees, your vendor partners. 
and it's hard to take risk, you know, and we, and I was running a, a at the time, almost a $500 million software company. And it was a struggle to, to get more investment, the investment I knew we needed in things like R and D to enhance our software or in customer service, where the cost to hire is, is minimal compared to the impact that you can have on value creation by just having better service. So I took the leap. I went to run a business that was private equity owned. It was two years into the private equity firm's hold. It was in the facility services space, all outsourced facility services for retail, restaurant, hospitality. Um, that business was based in Wichita, Kansas, by the name of Quality Solutions Incorporated, QSI facilities. We, we, when I took over that business, we needed a lot of, a lot of work. Uh, we needed to enhance the leadership team, put new ERP software in, rebrand the company, really look at our overall go-to-market strategy, which included pricing and service delivery, just a whole host of, of business strategy and operational overhauls. We eventually sold it to Cushman and Wakefield. And at that time, Cushman and Wakefield being really solid people who I'm still in touch with, but I, my, my intention was not to go back to private ec- or public companies, it was to go and stay on private equity. And I really enjoyed HVAC the most out of all the trades we served because I felt that HVAC was the stickiest of the trades that we managed at QSI. We would do flooring, we would do uh, roofing, we would do windows and doors and electrical and a lot of other things. And it just, it always came back to HVAC. It was the hardest business to win. Um, in many cases, the hardest to deliver, but also the stickiest if you did both well. And when we sold QSI, I made a, made a decision that I was only gonna look for HVAC companies that had self-performing capability. We weren't subbing it out. And they were much more focused on the more complex commercial and industrial type systems where the work is much more applied. It's not as easy to, to perform that. You're not just a number. Your technician actually provides a lot of expertise and experience that you can charge for, and that allow you to become a real partner with your with your customers. So did that in 2019. Um, we grew aggressively through COVID. Uh, these numbers are actually old. I should have given you guys updated numbers. We we now have about 2,000 employees, um, about 1,700 technicians, and um, we're in 12 states with 41 locations across the country. And it's been a wild ride. It's been a good ride. Um, but, but I love what I do. I love this industry. I love the trades in general. And I think there's no, there's no secret that the trades offer a, an employee, an owner, a private equity firm, a recurring revenue stream and profit stream that even in, uh, call it turbulent economic and geopolitical times, which, I mean, have we ever lived through more turbulent times? Um, it can offer an investor a really nice steady return. So that's, uh, that's the high level. Um, Reedy Industries was just rebranded to Premistar yesterday. Um, there's a long story there I won't bore everybody with, but the Reedy family wanted their name back, which they have the right to, to have. And we also have developed our business to a, to a point where we have market density in several major MSAs. And it just makes sense to, to uh, you know, put the legacy brands, you know, in, in a place they should be honored and, and with legacy, but to go to a new brand that tells a a greater story of value and it's unified. And when we do that, and as we do that, we believe we're going to create a whole lot more value for everybody. So yeah, that's the, uh, that's the high level. That's so exciting. Um, I mean, just seeing the growth, right. Yeah. Just since we got the numbers from you, you've already almost doubled from what, from what we had here. Um, uh, plus the rebrand. I mean, really exciting stuff. Thanks for sharing. Yeah. Oh, my pleasure. It's, it's fun to be in this space. Yeah, I bet. Well, we want to hear a lot more about it. Um, so, you know, we'll stick to kind of just talking about PE and, and, and in general, when you think about private equity groups, what are the goals? What are the, what are the typical goals for most private equity groups? It's a great question. You know, private equity, I think in general, private equity gets a bad rap. Um, I, I was probably as skeptical as anybody, maybe more so when I left a, what was a pretty steady career on, on the public company side, I was pretty skeptical of it. But private equity really is just a different ownership structure, which allows a group of investors, typically they're getting their funds from large institutions or very high net worth individuals. Normally it's, it's, it's institutions like pension funds, insurance companies, um, investment firms that want a uh, diversification for their overall portfolio. And, and also want to put their money where they may be able to get a more aggressive return, albeit with a little more risk. 
So private equity firms will typically raise funds. You'll see private equity funds that advertise their returns on fund one, fund two, fund three, and so on and so forth over a period of time they've been doing this. They'll take a, a bunch of equity that they've raised, money they've raised, and they'll pair that with debt. And they'll go out into the market and they'll buy companies that they'll call platform companies. And those platform companies will be their, call it their hub or their flag in the ground in a given service uh, you know, business or geography, or usually a combination of all three. And then usually uh, PE firms will try to grow those businesses through organic means, of course, but also by acquiring other companies to bolt on or add on. Um, at Reedy, we were acquired, this is before I was hired, or as I was being hired, we were acquired by a PE firm out of Boston by the name of Audax Group, A-U-D-A-X. Audax has been around for you know, 25 years, and they are they really have the, the blue chip reputation in the private equity space of knowing how to grow a business through acquisition. They have a whole team of people that helps walk through that. But really, the, the goal is to take a platform business in, a, in an industry and invest in it. That's the biggest misconception about private equity is that, you know, private equity firm buys you and they take all the cost out. Really, that, that couldn't be further from the truth. I mean, I'm sure there have been, ex, you know, examples in the, in the past and the, probably the you know, far past where a really underperforming company that was bloated with costs was acquired, cost was taken out and then brought back to market quickly, kind of like flipping a house. That is the major exception, not the rule. The rule typically is a, a firm makes an investment and then they double down that investment with more money being pumped in into people, process and technology so that they can take this business to the next level. The other thing private equity typically does is work in tranches uh, or levels. So you have a kind of smaller market, smaller to mid-market, mid-market, and then mid-market to upper, upper market uh, breakdown. So a lot of companies will, or PE firms will buy companies that are anywhere from call it one to 5 million in operating income, adjusted operating income. Uh, otherwise you could call EBITDA, right? They'll buy them at that level and they'll try to double or triple that before taking it to market and selling it to the next level of firms that are more accustomed to taking things from say 15 or 20 million in operating income upwards of 60, 70, 80. Um, but yeah, PE firms are investors that, you know, the, the best ones out there are the ones that want to invest in you, the platform, or you, the add-on to a platform to, to grow the business profitably so that when they do go to, to exit or when they achieve some kind of financial event, so to speak, a recapitalization, uh, all the people that have some form of ownership really benefit. And uh, I can say when you have the right people with the right values and the right culture, um, it can be a tremendously life-changing experience as it has been for myself and for really everybody that's in a leadership position, even beyond at Reedy, now Premistar. Really cool. I mean, you, you talk a lot about uh, the investment side of it. You talk a lot about the culture side of it. Um, yeah. But I imagine through that expertise, there's a ton of benefits too, right? What are... You know, if, if I'm a, a mom and pop shop or even a, a somewhat larger or even a massive shop that gets acquired by a PE yeah. group, what can I look forward to? I mean, what, what are some of the benefits of that? Yeah, I mean, first of all, a lot of businesses reach a certain point where they either don't know how to take their business to the next level, or even if they do, they don't have the capital to do it. And um, it could also be a point where they're done. It's, it's a lot of work to build your own business, whether you're a million dollar company or a hundred million dollar plus company. Right. It's a lot of work. It can often be a lot of sacrifice on, on family life and balance. And so whatever the reason is for somebody to get to that stage, the benefits are that if you choose the right partner and, and there are, there, they are different, they are all different. A lot of private equity firms on the surface will say the same things, but they are all very different. And there are certain things you can look for and ask that I'd be happy to get into about that. But when you sell your business, you know, one of the main benefits for someone is the opportunity potentially to keep equity in. So you may sell your business for say $10 million and the private equity firm that you partner with might provide you an opportunity to take, call it 15, 20, 30, or 40% of that and put it right back in. So in, in, in many cases, you know, you can sell your business say for 10 million, you can roll your money back in and make anywhere from three to five times your rollover in there. So it's not really just about today and what I get, you know, in the form of a check at close, but also what I, what kind of value can I create longer term? Uh, the other thing that's a huge 
piece of the puzzle, at least in our space on the HVAC side, is a lot of people built these businesses themselves. Either they're, they started it themselves or it's multi-generational in the family all the way back to, in, our, in some cases, we have businesses that go back to the early 1900s. And it's, you know, they believe and they, they value their people so much, their family. And so the challenge they have is if they don't invest and reinvest and double down themselves, which requires their own capital, then they have a, a harder path to creating a legacy for the future leadership and employee base. And so a huge benefit I've seen here at Reedy is you know, the Reedy family decided to, to, to sell a large portion of the business. They still are owners today, but they, they took some equity, a lot of equity out of the business, but it turned over opportunities for others to have equity in that otherwise wouldn't be a business owner. And that's a, that's a huge deal. And I would say the ability for employees or owners to reinvest in their own company is absolutely without question a force multiplier on performance. There's just something different about being an owner. There's oh, something that? different about it. And um, that's been a huge impact to our business over the last three years. I bet. I mean, you got some of these these generational family owned businesses, right? Like, yeah, that I can't imagine they just want to turn over the keys completely. So having that having that vested stake in, in, in the success of the company, I, I, I imagine, is, is a really important aspect of it. And the benefits that you all bring to what they can do growth wise sounds um, sounds really cool. It is. It's, it's exciting to see. I mean, for me. You know, I always, I always say I've got, I've got four daughters and I, I'm always worried about somebody doing something somewhere. You know, it's, you live, if you have any kids anyways, you're always worried about them. And I always say to myself, yeah, when I'm on my, when I'm on my deathbed someday, am I really going to think about the, the margin improvement we made in 2022 or, you know, the business we acquired in, in 2023, it's really going to be about the lives it changed. And I think the biggest thing for me going into the private equity space um, is it really is truly a platform to change lives. You, you can do it with public companies and you can certainly do it on your own. It's just a lot harder. Um, it's just a lot harder. So yeah. it's been an exciting path for me and it, not without bumps, not without bumps and bruises, but um, I'm a big believer. Yeah. I mean, you, you, you see the experience that you and your team bring um, there's you've been through some of the bumps that um you could bring that resource to somebody else. It's really cool. Yeah. Um, okay, cool. Well, let, let's, you know, I'm really curious to talk about, I don't know how, how it's done, right? Um, so, so starting with some of the basics, just the simple stuff, how are private equity acquisitions typically structured? I mean, like, how does that look from, from soup to nuts? Yeah, I mean, there's, there's multiple ways it can happen. The, the two most common ways are, somebody decides I want to sell my business and they have a contact somewhere or uh, they have a peer, which is very common in the trades. They have a peer who's done this before. So they reach out to them and say, can you, can you give me a contact? Can you put me in touch with someone that can help me think about how I would do this? That's one path. The other path, and let's just say that would be called, I would call that the proprietary path. There's nobody in the middle, right? The other path is, a, is a, a broker led deal that could be an investment banker that could literally be a broker. It could be, um, you know, a third party accountant or, or lawyer that has a network to potential buyers. Nowadays, with the trades and facility services being right there next to software as probably the, you know, one in two of the most uh, coveted spaces for private equity firms to get into. Um, a lot of deals are broker or investment banker led. And that's okay. You know, it, it's not a bad thing. We've, we've acquired companies that are brought to us through a broker or investment banker, and we've acquired businesses that we made the contact with that company and we led that deal together. But typically there's some sort of introduction or lead path that, that gets you to that table. And then, you know, you do a little bit of a dance. You, you know, you talk about the fit, the potential fit. You, there's a cultural question. There's a personality chemistry question. Do I, do I think that this firm is a firm that could potentially own my company and they're doing the same thing looking at you? Um, when you get enough of that kind of initial trust there, typically you sign a non-disclosure agreement and you start diving into numbers, right? You start sharing maybe revenue projections, profitability projections, customer type, customer market segments, um, margin trends, uh, backlogs, things that will give a potential buyer a sense of what they need to know 
to provide you a range of valuation. Um, often a broker will, will really do that for you. They'll dive in and even create what's called a, uh, a certified investment memorandum or a SIM for short, which is basically a teaser that talks about your business and advertises it to potential buyers. But once that's, once that's in place, and there's some back and forth during that phase, all while under an NDA, which is a must, um, you, you really talk about valuation. And you also talk about what this could look like if we joined forces. So it's not just how much are you willing to pay me? It's also, what are you going to do with the company? How can I help? How should we be structured? Are we a platform for you that you're going to build off of? Or are we an add-on to a platform you already have? Do you have experience in the HVAC or electrical or plumbing space or whatever the trade may be? You go back and forth on those things. And typically that will lead to either what's called an IOI, an indication of interest, which is always a range of value. Or if things are progressing quickly and fast and after a couple of dates, you're thinking of, of making it serious, um, it can get to what's called an LOI, which is a letter of intent that's got an actual price tag on it and a path to closing a deal. Um, which usually includes some some window of exclusivity, which means, hey, we're gonna we're gonna sign this LOI. I want to sell you my business for X amount of money. We have 60 days to get it done, 90 days to get it done. Usually, it's in that 60 to 90 day range. It can be faster, it can be longer, um, but that that's what leads to what's what what is commonly known as your your due diligence stage, where the buyer brings in, you know, uh, technology, legal, operational, commercial. Um, you know, compliance type diligence partners, uh, financial that will look at your books, that will dig a little deeper into the business, all again under confidentiality and really verify that what you told them your business is really is your business, especially the financial side of it. And at that point, um, if things check out and normally there's back and forth in that, I mean, no business is perfect. And, um, you know, these are very important agreements. If that all checks out, then you, you sort of finish that window of time with a discussion around how are we going to make this a success? So we've already verified the value. We've checked the boxes on the key diligence areas. Now let's talk about integration strategy. Are you going to leave us alone entirely? And we're just going to keep running our business with your capital behind us? Or the other extreme, are we going to integrate into your software, into your building, into your brand? And are we going to actually jump onto your platform and, and drive significant change. Both, both decisions are, are made by both parties typically and, and really made with the idea of what's gonna create the most value for the shareholder and for the owners. Um, once you figure that out, you, you, you get yourself to close, you, you close on this with a purchase agreement of some sort, whether it's a stock purchase or an asset purchase. And then the day after close, you're, you're now acquired. Um, what I would say after that is, you know, post-close diligence is a real thing too. You know, you don't, you don't really know your buyer and your buyer doesn't really know who they acquired until you've sold the business and you live together for a little while. It's kind of like buying a house. You buy a house, you think you know it inside now, you had an inspection, you think, oh my gosh, this is, this is the, the best thing ever. And then you live in a house and you find things you love even more and some things you don't love. And that's pretty typical. So I would say a classic realistic expectation for post-close diligence and integration is it's really six months to a year. It takes time. Uh, some can move faster than others, but it, it takes time. But you know, the most important thing for me during this process is that it's that trust and relationship across both sides. If that's established early and built throughout the process, especially as you overcome inevitable hurdles, it can be a tremendously satisfying and fulfilling experience. Yeah, it sounds like it. Um, I, I do want to. I want to dig into that a little bit more. I want to get into. Um, kind of what happens after a deal and, and, and what people should do to prepare. But um, just curious, as, as, a, as a PE, being on the PE side, um, what KPIs or key performance indicators do, do y'all pay special attention to yeah. when, when looking at this? You, you mentioned how you usher in technology and you're looking for KPIs. And this is kind of where I feel like build ops and, and, and a PE firm like yours gets starts to to interact a little bit more but um yeah i'd be really curious what kpis y'all yeah and just just for the record um i'm on the pe side when we're acquiring companies but i am i'm actually the ceo of an actual mechanical and i only say that because um i've been both seller and buyer and uh three times now so 
hopefully that helps give some context to the the color I'm adding. Um, sure. Look, I think I think you start as a seller or a buyer, but really as a seller for those that are currently leveraging BuildOps software, you start with thinking through what's going to drive the most value. How am I going to differentiate from other businesses like mine that that may be also for sale? And it's it starts with recurring business. The number one you know value creator is is recurring business. Obviously valuation is, well, let me say, obviously, some people are new to this. Valuation is normally a multiple of your adjusted income. So some buyer will typically fight over you and they will pay you a multiple of what they perceive through diligence to be uh, your, your income. Um, but, but, you know, that income is really not steady unless you can prove that it recurs year after year. Uh, thus, there's a big you know, divide in the investment industry between construction heavy trades companies and service heavy trades companies. You know, in the in the trades, especially on the commercial and the industrial side, like us, you, you can't avoid project work or construction work, nor do you want to, because it can be extremely profitable and it can really help you grow the top line and the bottom line of your business if you if you do it well. But your service base and your direct to owner relationships, the amount of business you can drive through someone other than a general contractor and where you can prove that you have that customer year after year after year, and you've been able to maintain or expand your margins year after year after year, that is a huge driver of valuation. That can be the difference between five to 10 multiple points in what someone pays you for your income, depending on your size and your business. So it starts with recurring business and then it, then it gets into profitability. You know, you can have recurring customers that you can prove you've had for 20 years, but if your profitability and your rates have dropped steadily over those 20 years, that's a real hit to your valuation. So making sure you can prove that you, you charge for the value you provide and you've been able to maintain or better yet, expand your margins, but maintain a, a healthy customer base, those are, those are critical. And then you get into things that are, that are really key in our, in our world which are the technicians, the people that turn wrenches, change filters, install units, uh, run wire, you know, snake lines, whatever the trade you're in. Um, nothing happens in our space without the people. Our product is our people. It's not a widget that we're pumping out. And so retention and quality of technician and field resources and foreman, it's a huge deal. It's a huge deal. You can have tremendously high recurring revenue and expanding margins. But if you're turning over your workforce 40, 50, 60% every year, that's going to really detract from what someone's going to want to pay because there's a lot of risk there. Um, so, you know, the financial side, the revenue, the margins, the um, retention of key employees, uh, leadership, I think, would be one that can't go unmentioned. I mean, who's running the business and not just who's running the business, but what does the next wave of key lieutenants look like that may take this business to the next level? These are all questions we ask, very, very important. Um, and then I think the other piece that's, that's certainly critical is financial stability. So it's not just revenue and margin, but it's collecting cash. You know, are you able to collect on the, on the profitable revenue that you drive? When you put those things in a bucket, there's other things around there, like legal structure or legal, legal issues or technology issues. I would say one thing that is really important that wraps all this together is the technology system. And this is, I mean, a great tie in to build ops. Um, you know, I, I, you can see the quote there. I mean, I did say that, you know, the reality is technology is either an accelerant or a deterrent to a deal for us. If somebody has switched technology systems four times over five years or worse, they haven't made the necessary changes they've had to make and they can't, we can't really trust their numbers. Uh, that's a problem, right? That's a problem that, that provides or that presents risk to a buyer. On the flip side of that, if you have a system that allows you to really scale and grow and integrate with other systems that might provide you sales pipeline management or procurement, which is a huge deal in today's world with supply chain challenges, or it's got training modules that allow your, your field technicians to, to be more effective and more efficient or to learn and train more effectively, that's a massive deal. Um, so I think, you know, you think about it in kind of those big buckets, the revenue and margin, the, the technicians and leadership themselves, and then the technology and financial stability that, that comes with it. Those are the big pieces that will drive someone 
to really think through, do they want to acquire you and invest in you? And if so, how much are they willing to spend and what are they going to do with your business? Really cool. Yeah. I mean, it, it strikes me, you talk about the people at the business, right? How, how much culture matters. Um, and then yeah. just as importantly, right? Happy clients, long-term clients who are not only happy year in and year out, but they're seeing the value and they're, they're willing to pay more because the value is increasing and ever increasing from, from the, the service that's being provided. So um, I love hearing that. That's, that's very similar in our industry, <laughs> you know, in the software industry, we've, sure. we've, we've got to provide value year over year and um, we've got to keep people happy. So uh, it's really cool hearing that. Um, how about more on sort of the financial side? Um, I've, I've heard you use the term multiple times today already. Um, and, and it's a term that you hear often when you're talking about private equity. Um, but, but EBITDA, yeah, yeah. what is it? Why is it so important? Um, yeah. It sounds like a foreign word. Uh, it's not the easiest acronym to, to say. <laughs> so, um, yeah. but, but, but explain to us what that means. Yeah. So, you know, when you think about... Um, when you think about profitability, like I said, most businesses are valued as a multiple of their earnings. Um, earnings can be defined in a lot of different ways. The PE world typically defines um, that base for evaluation in something called EBITDA, which is your earnings, your operational earnings before interest payments, uh, taxes, depreciation, and amortization. So basically what they're saying is, uh, tell me all of the operational earnings you have and add back the things that are one-timers that aren't going to recur or that aren't really detracting from your operating income. So you might have a tremendous amount of depreciation, for example, because you built a new building. Um, typically, you're building, you're not going to build a new building every year. You're going to be in that building for maybe 20 or 30 years. So you don't want the depreciation um, that comes with that to affect the overall profitability that someone might want to pay for. And, and the other thing too, is it's not a cash item, right? That you, you spent the cash to build that building. So really that shouldn't affect your value to a potential buyer. So, but if you really want to think about it, it's, it's your operational earnings with everything that you could possibly add back that would be realized earnings under a, under a different owner. Um, in many cases, you know, business owners of small or medium-sized businesses will run a lot of personal expenses through their income statement that takes away from operational earnings, but that's not really operational earnings. If you have a house or a boat or a second business or family members on the payroll that are doing minimal amount of work, but have been there for years, all, a lot of that changes when you're acquired or invested in by a private equity firm. And so you take all those costs that run through your your P&L, your income statement, and you add them back. That, that's what becomes your adjusted operating income or, or what's known as EBITDA. And, um, you know, there's 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 both an art and a science to EBITDA. The, the good private equity firms will have somebody in a third-party capacity, an accounting firm like a KPMG or a, an Alvarez and Marcel uh, or an RSM. These are some names you, you know people on the phone may have heard of. They'll have people like that that will come in and they will look through your books while you're under NDA and you're under LOI and you're in the diligence phase. And they will report back to you what they think your EBITDA really is after making those adjustments. I can tell you out of the 18 deals we've done in three years, in the majority of our deals, the EBITDA was actually higher under our assessment than it was under the seller's assessment. So I say that not for you to expect yours to be higher, um, but I say it be, in, the, in the sense that we're all trying to, you know, good private equity firms and good buyers are trying to get to the actual value that they want to, you know, bid off of. Yeah. The so don't be afraid of that, you know. Yeah. The, the exercise you described earlier, kind of digging in together is, is, is it can be, a, it's a useful exercise, right? It's, it's sort right. of like, it, it sounds very collaborative um, and, and can end up really showing true colors of a business. So um Okay, cool. Yeah, I think that I think that explains to to our listeners a little bit more about um, what to expect, how to how to sort of seek out something like this, um, what to what to do to differentiate yourself, um, and really what what's being looked at under the hood. Um, let's fast forward past all that, right? Sure. We go through all that. We do the collaboration. The NDA signed. We're feeling really good. 
your team's feeling really good. Things are going great. What happens after that deal is done? I mean, you know, if I'm a founder, you know, it's, it's O'Donnell mechanical and it's been passed down for generations yeah. in my family. What happens to that? What, what happens to yeah. me as a founder? What happens to my leadership team that I've built out post acquisition? Give, give me a, give me a sense for, for what to expect. Yeah. You know, I think it's, it, look, I think, um, I like to think of things pretty simplistically, but I think of them in terms of people, process, and technology. You know, and if, if you if you are doing the right things and you have the right partners, assuming that's happening, you're going into the close period with some level of agreed uh, integration plan. And the integration plan is usually a operational, a commercial, a financial, a technological um, and a cultural plan where you're covering everything from who are the key employees in the business that need to have some kind of retention agreement. If I'm a business owner, for example, and this is a huge deal, and I've got a sales guy or gal, and I've got a handful of really strong technicians that, that really own the relationships with their accounts, and that is the recurring nature of my business, which hence is the recurring nature of my value, I want to have some kind of plan around making sure they stick around after I sell the business. And my buyers probably want that too. On the technology side, again, bring it back to build ops. I wanna know how am I going to run this business when I now have a new owner? Am I going to be integrating my software into theirs? Am I gonna be asked to jump onto totally new software and sunset what I'm using? Am I gonna stand alone? And if so, what kind of financial and operational KPIs do I need to prepare be prepared to deliver on a, on, a, on a monthly, quarterly basis, which will be required. Um, from a commercial perspective, you know, what are the most coveted accounts that I'm selling and that I'm, or that I'm acquiring if I'm the buyer? Just like I talked about with people, what is my strategy to retain and grow those accounts? That's a big one for us. I mean, we, we typically, we do have a much, call it a higher capital threshold than the businesses we're acquiring. A lot of the businesses we acquire are, are resistant to large projects with existing service customers. So you might have a manufacturing facility that wants to replace you know, a significant amount of their, their air-cooled chillers. And uh, that could be a multi-million dollar investment. If I'm a small mechanical that provides great service, I may not have the financial wherewithal to do that. But as part of Premistar, I now do. So you typically will take those buckets to name three as examples, and you'll put together a plan and you'll really think through over the next 30, 60, 90, 120, all the way out to 360, over those, those days in that period, how am I going to execute appropriately on this integration plan and make sure I, I maximize performance? It's not easy. Um, it'd be great if it was just a simple binder that you roll out to everybody and say, check these boxes each week, each day. But the more, here's what I would say, two things were good nuggets to take away. The, the, as soon as an LOI is signed, and diligence starts, that's the day you should start integration planning. One mistake people make is they sign an LOI, they focus on diligence, they get to the finish line, and then they start asking their questions with 24, 48 hours to go. Holy crap, what do we now do, right? And the biggest challenge with that, Kevin, is there's a whole lot of people in the building of the seller's business that don't know this is going on. And so a really important strategy is going to be when and how you bring people you know, into the loop and into the fold. And then once you do that, how you manage their reactions and include them ideally into the integration planning and then post-close execution. Probably the most important person that has to be in that fold at some point is your, your financial your financial manager, um, but maybe even their number two or number three as well, because reporting and process is so important. So those are a lot of the things that we think about and we actually coach our our acquisitions to work on while we're going through the diligence phase. And if it's done well, uh, it, you know, it can be a huge success and it can be smooth sailing. If it's not, uh, it can be challenging. And we've lived through some of those challenges too. Very cool. Yeah. I mean, we talked about the KPIs. Uh, I want to hear a little bit more about sort of the, the non-tangibles that you look for. Um, you, you touched on it earlier, but it sounds very similar to what you just said needs to maintain throughout the integration yeah. um you know the culture the people the the relationships those people have with their clients um yeah it's paramount to the success of that that acquisition and that integration um so if 
if you could dig into that a little deeper, I'd love to hear just, yeah. you know, what specifically are you looking for when, when we talk about that? Um, and, 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 and then a second part to that, how do I, as a business owner of a mechanical shop or, or, or really any trade, put myself in a really good position and get myself into the, re- into the best shape to, to yeah. attract a potential buyer? It's a great question. I'll, I'll start, I'll go back with the first one, the non-tangibles. Um, really, really the intangibles on making this a success start with leadership. It weaves its way through clients and, and technicians. Um, th- that's the most important thing. So if you think of the leadership question, is the seller a single person? Is it a, is it a family? Is it a group of individuals that started or acquired this company at some point and are now selling? Depending on that answer, the next question is, are they staying or are they leaving? You have to ask that question early on. Um, that drives so much of the decision tree and the, the work from there on out. Uh, let's say they're staying. The next question is, okay, who owns the client relationships? Is it that leadership that's staying? Is it the leadership that's staying and the technicians that are there every day or every other day? Is it the salesperson plus some combination of the technician and the leadership? You got to map that out early on during the process because, again, we are a people business you're nothing without your people. We're not pumping widgets out. So you tackle those things. It's really important to have a strategy and a plan and be prepared to spend money on that. If I'm a seller, um, I I may want to get aggressive myself and not wait for the buyer to offer me a retention bonus or a, um, you know, or some kind of incentive to keep people. I may want to get ahead of that as I start bringing people into the mix and understanding what's going on. Typically that can happen in the last two or three weeks of a deal and uh, I've always encouraged our sellers to bring us in sooner rather than later, because, you know, people, if even business owners are skeptical of private equity and buyers, think about what their, their ops leader thinks or their service dispatcher thinks. When you get to meet with people like us and we walk into the room with jeans, boots and a golf shirt on and you look us in the eye, you realize we're also mechanical contractors like, like you, it totally disarms the room. And you have really transparent, honest conversation around like, who are you? What do you plan on doing with us? And, um, you know, vice versa. Who are you guys? And what would you like us to do with you? Right. That's a big, big deal. Um, so that's that's kind of the, the 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 intangible piece. If I think about how I would best position for a sale, um, really depends on the timing. If I'm thinking of selling sooner rather than later, it, it's it's probably getting your getting your story straight on why you're doing what you're doing. Um, Because that's something you're going to have to look in the eye of your employees and and you're going to have to tell them with conviction for them to believe in it. Again, you're nothing without your people. So if you don't have that story straight, you have that conversation, it doesn't go well. The worst thing that can happen is you have valuable people defect and jump off the ship before you've even had a shot. That happens a lot, unfortunately. Um, so I think, you know, it's, it's what's the story? Why are you doing what you're doing? Is it because you can't take the business to the next level? You want to retire? You want the next layer of, of leadership to have their shot at ownership or, or leadership or some combination of the two? I think that story is, is so important. But then on the business side, I would say, really, really think through your account base. Uh, most companies, including ours, we, we carry accounts we should have fired a long time ago. You know, in today's world where you've got technicians that don't have unlimited capacity and it's harder and harder to find them, you know, we're constantly looking at our customer base and saying, look, if we're not getting the value out of the people we're putting on these accounts, let's, let's, let's let go of those accounts and put our top people on accounts that want to grow with us and be partners. That that's probably a six month to a year long process. Um, But it's, it's one that makes a lot of sense. I always think of Southwest airlines, the Southwest airlines indirectly fires people every day, because if you want a seat assignment and a meal, they're not your, they're not your carrier. Right. And they know exactly who they're selling to. Um, and, and the funny thing there is years ago, their competitors like Delta, Delta Song, United, Ted, um, American Airlines, Light, or was Continental Light, I think at the time, they all failed because they couldn't do what, what Southwest did and be a large carrier at the same time. So I think think through your customer base, think through what accounts are adding value, what accounts aren't, and then really manage your pricing and your execution. Um, a, a real downer for a buyer is to get excited about a business's people, client base, and operation get into the weeds during diligence and find out that they're underpricing on the market. And that's tough because it's hard. It's really hard to go up in price and maintain clients. Um, so I'd say pricing, managing your margins, uh, making sure you're, you're smart about CapEx and OpEx as well to, to max your profitability. 
what's going to really drive valuation is the, the solid people that come with the business and the recurring nature of, of the clients you want to grow with. That's going to be key. The other thing is just the technology okay. piece. Again, I'm coming back to build ops, but if you can prove that you have real command of your numbers, not just your financial statements, but your operational KPIs. And, and, and this is something build ops is, is so advanced in because they're new and they've, they've taken the, the pitfalls of many platforms in the past and they've really built this into the day-to-day uh, transaction by transaction nature of, of trades businesses. If you can prove that, that's a huge deal as well. Cool. I mean, it sounds like, you know, time is money, right? And if you've got bad clients that are sucking up too much time yep. um, with, with, with how difficult it is to find good people, you want to maximize what you can do with those great people, right? And if they're that's spending right. too much time on a, on a brutal client, um, makes sense. Makes that's a right. lot of sense, actually. Um, tell me about, you know, what you're seeing in the, in the industry right now. What are, what are current trends? Um, you know, what are you noticing that sticks out to you? Yeah, it's interesting. Um, you know, we, we are at any given time where we're usually in process with six to eight types of deals all over the map, like small, smaller, you know, add-ons that are going into a business we've already invested in, in a new market or larger ones in new markets we're trying to get into. And a pretty common theme right now is uh, some degradation in earnings as we go through the process. So we've, we had a handful of LOIs early in the year. And as we're going through diligence, we're finding that what what might have been the you know trailing twelve month EBITDA of a business back in March or April or May, it has declined 10, 15, 20 percent. And I, I think a lot of that is attributed to the external factors in our world: supply chain, wage wage inflation, labor shortage. Um, people are really struggling across the board. And, and you know, if if any business out there, or business owner says that's not impacting them, they're lying. I mean, that's it's impacting the world, but that really is affecting valuations because where you might've thought you were paying, you know, four times, five times, 10 times for somebody as earnings wane through a process of due diligence and a quality of earnings, which we do normally, your, your multiple goes up and that can get to a point where you can't pull the trigger because you can't make the justification to go forward at such a high price. That's pretty common around uh, the space. The other thing I'm seeing is activity is, is let's put it this way, overall private equity activity has slowed versus last year. Last year was a high watermark, I think, in, in you know historically. It has slowed a little bit uh, due, due to a variety of reasons. It has not slowed as much in the trades. Uh, there are so many PE firms in the small, middle, and upper middle markets getting into trades, whether it's electrical, HVAC, plumbing, residential, or commercial. So while while valuations are, while earnings are struggling a little bit and um, external factors out there are still impacting us, you know, gas prices, you name it, you, you have this weird dynamic where typically that would slow down any sector or business, but you have so much capital out there in the private equity space that wants to get into the trades because in, in, in so many ways, if you're a service strong business, you're somewhat reset, recession resilient. Um, I don't think anybody's recession proof, but we are certainly resilient. And so it's this weird combination of things going on. I don't know where the where the multiples are going to go, but there's I would say the multiples are slowing a little bit. For a while there, they were growing rapidly um, due to supply and demand. And, and I see because of activity has slowed a little bit. I see them slowing, not necessarily going backwards, but slowing a little bit. Interesting. Okay, cool. Um, well. well with that being said, there's still a lot of PE money out there right now, right? What are, yeah. for our listeners, what are the pitfalls or red flags to watch out for when talking to, collaborating with, negotiating with um, a PE group? What, what sure. should our listeners um, on sort of the seller side really be paying close attention to and looking out for? It's a great question. Um, you know, outside of just the human interaction and making your own assessment on, is this somebody I'd want at my dinner table, right? That goes without saying. There are certain things in private equity firms that I, I now look for and, and I've, I've mandated are a part of my partnerships going forward. Number one is that the private equity firm has, has a real investment strategy, meaning they want to double down, not just in us, but they want to double down on pumping more investment into our people, into our technology, into our future. A lot of them will say, they are going to do that. And, and some, some will and some won't. You gotta you know, do your due diligence like you would if you're hiring someone 
um, really check references and, and mostly the backdoor references, not the references they give you, right? So do your networking, work with your peers in your trade and ask them, have you ever heard of these guys? What do you think of them? That, that, you know, that said. The other piece I would say is I prefer private equity firms that invest a lot of their own money in their own fund. That is uncommon. Um, Audax Group is, is tremendous because if you look at their most recent fund, I, it's like, I think it's like $6 billion. It's huge. And their own employees are like 20 or 30% of that, their own money. You know, what that does is it actually puts you, the, the seller, on the same side of the table with them, the buyer. They, they all have a vested interest in making it work because it's their money at risk too. Um, a lot of private equity firms don't do that. You know, I've, I've had some experiences myself where the PE firms have not invested a lot of their own money and it changes the dynamic. Uh, the businesses they acquired become more commodities and less valuable um, resources and valuable platforms. That's a big one. The other thing I think I would say is um, an experience in integration and acquisition. Uh, you, most larger PE firms are going to have that. There are a lot of smaller to mid-sized firms coming up in the market that are trying to make trades companies their platforms. And if they don't have an experience in doing this, I would be concerned. Uh, I, it doesn't mean it's a no, but I'd want to know if, if that firm has not had experience in integration and in investment and, and growth through acquisition, I'd want to know if the people that are there have. So I think that's a key question. And then the other thing I would say is just, you know, really pressure testing the firm on what their goal for the future is. I've, my last two private equity sponsors have invested in us, not, not for the three to five year flip, but to help build the best business they can that will run for the next hundred years. That's not lip service. That's real. You know, I'm going, you know, we're going through major investment in our business that, that may not have returns in the next three to five years, but our, our PE backers are fully supportive of that. Again, not every PE firm will, will, will back that up. It's one of the reasons why I left the public company space where you were so beholden to quarterly earnings and often you make ill-advised decisions to maximize that quarterly earnings versus privately backed companies, which can put money into something and not realize that value for two, three, four, five plus years. So I think those are some really key questions. The other thing I would just say is, you know, who's the deal lead? Make sure you identify with the deal lead. A lot of PE firms will have a deal lead and then a host of people underneath them that will kind of run the show every day. If you're trying to sell your business, get to know that deal lead really well and put a lot of pressure on them to back up what they're offering. Very cool. Okay, cool, man. Well, um, any last minute thoughts on, on just for folks out there, how to attract a PE firm? Um, you, you've told us yeah. a lot. You've, you've given us so much of your expertise on this. So. Um, we really appreciate it, but any final words on, on, Hey, here's, you know, we we're, it sounds like we've learned how to prepare. It sounds like we've learned how to build up to be being, um, really attractive, but, um, yeah. you know, final words on how to attract a PE firm. You know, um, I think the, the, probably the best advice I can give someone is, is be patient, right? Don't, don't rush into it, you know, do your due diligence, take your time. Um, we, we, we have a philosophy at, at Premistar when we get into this type of, of opportunity, which is on a regular basis of telling people, I, look, I know you have a bunch of other suitors that are courting you. We're not used car sales. We're not going to put pressure on you. You know, this is not a race to the finish line. And there's two things that come with that. One, it's who we are, right? We, we, this is about being a family after you close. This isn't about just making an acquisition. Um, but the other thing is if somebody doesn't value that, then they're probably not the right fit for us either. Um, so when I say be patient, I mean, you know, we, we acquired seven companies last year. I think we closed on seven, seven or eight, um, depending on the timing. And I would say in every case with one exception, we went several months beyond where we had planned to from start to finish, not because we were slow or they were slow because it has to be the right thing. And, um, you know, that's, that's an important, this is a huge decision. I think, you know, make sure that whoever you're talking to understands the gravity and the emotions that go into potentially selling your business. It's a big deal. And the right buyers will understand that and respect that. Very cool. Well, um, Joe, really, really appreciate uh, the time. Um, yeah. I've learned a ton. I'm sure our listeners will walk away learning a ton. And, um, you know, I, I think, 
what you shared today, just the, the, the knowledge, the experience you've got is going to be incredibly valuable for, for hopefully a lot of people listening. I know it was valuable for me just getting a deeper understanding of, of, of what you do and what you look for and, and, and how to, um, how to help our clients. I know we share the same industry. So, um, you know, it sounds like while your main interest is on the HVAC side, just this, this applies to all trades, right? Um, for so, sure. um, thanks again, man. Really, really appreciate yeah. your time, Joe. Really great. My pleasure. Love talking about it. Thanks, Kevin. Thank you to the build ops team. And uh, for anyone who's out there now or potentially watching this in the future, best of luck to you. It's a, it's an exciting time.